Back in October, I went to Valley Fair for the first time. After experiencing so many parks in June, I was unprepared for Valley Fair's capacity limit in response to COVID-19. Nobody to blame for that one except for myself. I was originally planning on experiencing Valley Scare's haunt event on a Saturday, but instead I had to settle for a short Sunday visit with shorter hours. This shorter Sunday operation day was not a haunt day, but was instead a more kid-friendly Great Pumpkin Fest event day. I don't feel like I've experienced enough of Valley Fair to properly review the park, but I wanted to open with a few of my thoughts before we dive into my rankings. Valley Fair first opened in 1976 and was acquired by Cedar Point in 1978. Five years later, Cedar Fair was formed as the parent company of both parks. Today, Cedar Fair is the parent company of a lot of parks. I was hoping to see some of this park's history for myself, then I went there and the entrance had charm, and we went inside and, uh, it sure was a Cedar Fair park. It's a shame to see former coasters Rails and Kitty Coaster, formerly known as Mild Thing, gone from this park. Especially with Rails being a former Cedar Point coaster and still in operation at a park in Maryland. I don't know, maybe it's just the history nerd in me, but Valley Fair for me just kind of felt like a generic Cedar Fair park that could use some more personality. Cedar Fair loves their flat color branding, and Valley Fair is covered in it without much individuality from the rest of the chain. Valley Fair also lacks gift shops and merchandise. It just, it feels like a park that its parent company does not care about so much anymore. There was no merchandise for any of the rides besides a single Renegade shirt. Size medium. Where Valley Fair does shine is within its great park staff and Wheel of Fortune, a chance rides Trevant form to a roulette wheel. Yes, it's a clean and charming park with a lovely entrance and, in my opinion, a slightly underrated top four coaster lineup. So my impressions of Valley Fair is that it's a cute and fun park that could be injected with a little bit of personality. And again, this visit was not under regular season operation and it was pretty brief. Being any time constraint, I had to get my my ride in the fast lane. which allowed for plenty of re-rides. With that out of the way, I did quite enjoy this park and its coaster lineup. I did not ride Cosmic Coaster, as it is a fully powered kiddie coaster and I shockingly still draw the line somewhere. I just wanted to ride Renegade more. Number 7. Corkscrew soured Aero Loopers on me a little bit. Until Corkscrew, all of the Aero Loopers that I've been on were a little bit more on the intense side. I really like Aero's vertical loops. They have a strong pull to them if the train navigates them fast enough. Corkscrew felt slow and rather forceless to me. Despite this, Corkscrew has a few redeeming qualities. Corkscrew's setting is beautiful, and I love the layout's interactions over the pond. The double corkscrew inversion has the first corkscrew going over the train, which is always the best choice for any park with a corkscrew coaster. The second corkscrew hangs over the pond, which is always the second best choice for any park with a corkscrew coaster. Corkscrew's paint scheme is awesome, the teal supports look really pretty with the alternating orange and yellow tones between ride elements. This bright and colorful paint scheme also pairs well with the closely located Planet Snoopy area, which is a great touch. Corkscrew is a completely inoffensive coaster. It seems like a good choice as somebody's first inverting coaster. I doubt anybody will get much headbanging from this one. American manufacturer Aero pumped out many of these time and time again, and this one is just your run of the mill Aero Looper. Number six. Yeah, take me for a ride. I liked it more than Corkscrew because the name was kind of funny. Number 5 No, actually I liked it more than Corkscrew because it was a more unique and historic credit. High Roller is the oldest ride at Valley Fair and an original that opened with the park in 1976. It was built by then Roanhorst Corporation, a Minnesotan company that constructed most of Valley Fair. High Roller's designer International Amusement Devices Incorporated also built the original trains. I wish I could have experienced the IAD trains for myself, but High Roller has had PTC trains since 2016. This was my first run in with an IAD coaster. Most notably, IAD built Colossus at Six Flags Magic Mountain. IAD was formerly NAD, a name that's also kind of funny. During this NAD period, they built and designed dozens of interesting wooden roller coasters, including the original Zip and Pippin at Liberty Land. 
So I was happy to experience my first IAD NAD wooden roller coaster. High Roller is an out and back coaster that I feel has potential to be really good. The last few airtime hills are alright, but without the trim break out of a turnaround, they could be amazing. The trim break seems egregious, and the first hill after the drop tries its hardest to kill any momentum going into that turnaround. High Roller is alright. It has pacing issues with the first hill and the turnaround. So once again, we have a case of totally inoffensive coaster. Dare I say, it was even a little fun. <laughs> Number five. Yeah, take me for a ride. Now to talk about a middle of the road wild mouse. That's not to say I find anything wrong with Mad Mouse, I found it extremely charming. This was my first wild mouse by manufacturer Arrow, and the word on the street is that it's not the best Arrow wild mouse. I wouldn't know, but I kind of get that vibe riding it. I love the multicolored mouse cars that the passengers sit in, and my favorite part was the descending turn that dropped suddenly out of nowhere. This roller coaster used to have a really cool paint job playing with the unique supports. The structure, colors, track, and cars all together made the coaster look like a toy brought to life. Currently, Mad Mouse is a gross combination of mustard yellow and desaturated orange. They really should just paint it the way that it was originally. Some colors are just really awful together, and faded over time, this orange and yellow is pretty nasty. Despite the gross paint, Mad Mouse is fun and has charm. A warning, this roller coaster is a popular family attraction with really low capacity. Of course. So I didn't have to worry about the hour long queue, but if you don't have fast lane, make sure to hit up Mad Mouse early. You do not want to be stuck in that line. Oh, I think I just realized why Rails is gone. Number four. Yeah, take me for a ride. It almost feels like there's an unspoken rule in the coaster community that you should not like Wild Thing. But also it feels like genuinely nobody in the coaster community likes Wild Thing. This roller coaster has been clowned on by almost every coaster channel I watch. Just posting a photo of this coaster in my Instagram story with the caption, Y'all are too mean to this coaster. Got me DMs saying more mean things about this coaster. 2021 felt like the first year that enthusiasts eased up on some of the less popular Morgan Hyper coasters, specifically the Cedar Fair Morgan Hyper coasters. Arrow's Magnum XL200 at Cedar Point set the standard for hyper coasters, or roller coasters intended to be 200 feet or taller. That standard was plentiful airtime hills and large turnarounds. I believe Cedar Fair wanted a Magnum XL200 for three of their parks, and manufacturer DH Morgan was happy to help. So DH Morgan made something Magnum-like, but without the janky arrow qualities. Magnum's bunny hills were a happy accident because Arrow bent track like Bender when you insert girder. Have you seen Arrow's other hyper coasters after Magnum XL200? I don't think they even have bunny hills. So once again, Wild Thing is a first for me, being my first Morgan hyper coaster. And once again, word on the street is, it's like the worst of its model. If this is the worst Morgan hyper coaster, well, then I think their worst is still pretty fun. I have yet to ride a boring hyper coaster, and Wild Thing is no exception with its 207 foot height and 197 foot drop. The first drop is actually shaped a little bit like an arrow coaster drop as it reaches its steepest angle of descent later than usual. As the train gains momentum down the drop, you lift out of your seat more and more. The following hill is a little different as it stretches far out and delivers sustained airtime. It's essentially a really, really big speed hill and it's kind of awesome. This next section involves three comically large turns. It seems like a waste of track because it is. The lower points in these turns pull some nice positives, and I appreciate the uninterrupted moments of speed. Shades of high roller with trim brakes cutting momentum from what would otherwise be an otherworldly series of bunny hills. Every hill had short floater airtime, and the tunnel is a good tunnel. I like this series of bunny hills, and even though they are directly related to Magnum's finale of bunny hills, I'm going to act like they are not. Magnum's violent ejector airtime is not comparable to this. I really like the name Wild Thing, I really like the paint colors, I think it's unique. Wild Thing is a very fun coaster, and that's why I have it at number 4. Number 3. Yeah, take me for a ride. This community has acted like Excalibur has been on the chopping block for a good five or more years now, so I wanted to get out and ride it for myself. 
And now that the ride has a little bit of a cult following in the community, I... eh... Excalibur is a very good coaster. Excalibur is a very fun coaster. Excalibur is a very short roller coaster. And this is coming from somebody who appreciates roller coasters regardless of what length they are, usually. If the coaster packs a good punch and has at least three or four good elements, I can excuse length even if it's very, very short. Excalibur doesn't so much have ride elements as it does, um... Well, it traverses pretty intensely, and it has plenty of jankiness from its manufacturer, Aerodynamics. It really does ride like a fast and aggressive Aero Mine Train. There's this very jerky airtime hill out of this turn. Um, a lot of people are fans of it. I'm a fan of this hill as well. But all in all, it felt like Excalibur was over just in an instant. Once you blink, it's done. It just feels like one that needs to be rewritten a few times in order to get fulfillment. So then why did I rank Excalibur higher than Wild Thing? Excalibur is crazy. It's like if Cedar Fair asked for Arrow to build them a backyard roller coaster. I love the sign with the sword. I like the flags. It's a short coaster. Number two. I'm just going to say that I really, really like Intamin Impulse launch coasters. I love the way that they sound when they launch. I love that weird whirring electric uh, kind of screaming sound that it makes when it launches. Of course, this is the twist and spike model. You have the spike and spike model, the twist and twist model, but the spike and twist being the most common model. And although one of these is at my home park, Six Flags Great America, the holding brake has not been in operation for a long time. And I went to this park, like I mentioned, in October. I had recently heard that the holding brake was no longer working, so I was not expecting it. And even walking up to the ride, I was not watching the holding brake at all. I went through the line. I just stared at Instagram the whole time I was in line and when I got on I was like, okay It's gonna feel like v2 and lo and behold we hit that holding brake and it stops us It works and I fly into my restraint and I am I am on cloud nine y'all I am so happy with this holding brake. I Without any exaggerating at all the holding brake is the best element of this ride for me because I really do like the straight spike more than I do the twisting spike. The twisting spike can give you some nice positive forces, especially if you sit more towards the front so that you're hitting the valley of that twisting spike harder. But better than that, in my opinion, is the straight spike, which gives you floater airtime when you are sitting closer towards the back. And then that holding brake, you fall forwards in your restraint from that holding brake, and then once it releases the train, you see the train fall before you feel yourself fall. It's a great element, it's like a dive coaster, it's similar to the Mr. Freeze reverse launch. It's a unique element that is in a realm of its own, and that's why I have Steel Venom at number 2. It is a launch coaster that I really, really like, but when the holding brake works... Wow! You get a moment to remember on that coaster, and some tremendous airtime out of it. In what's looking to be Valley Fair's last coaster to ever be installed, Renegade is an incredible wooden roller coaster by Great Coasters International. Compared to the other two GCIs I've ridden, American Thunder and Mystic Timbers, Renegade is pretty intense. I love Mystic Timbers at Kings Island. The theming alone gets a lot of points for me, but it's the out of control feeling of quick turns and airtime pops populating the coaster's layout that made me fall in love with it. But Mystic Timbers is more or less an out and back coaster. Once Renegade crosses the road and essentially leaves the park, it just goes wherever it wants. Renegade is jazz, baby. It's scatting all over the place. Renegade is very unpredictable, much like my favorite wooden roller coasters. This coaster is comparable to the likes of wooden coasters at Holiday World. But is it just as good? 
I don't really know where it ranks for me yet, but Renegade is for sure a top 10 wooden roller coaster for me. But Twisting Drop is extremely unique, changing directions halfway through. Where Renegade has an edge over Mystic Timbers for me is where it provides more sustained forces. The bottom of this drop provides a fairly long moment of positive and lateral forces. There's a perfect 50-50 balance of larger elements like this and shorter elements too. Short pops of airtime and laterals, sustained airtime and laterals, positive packed banked turns. Renegade does it all and has wild pacing throughout. The return to the station is fantastic as well. I love the station flyby airtime hill and the following interaction with the ride's queue. Renegade is intense, and it's riding a little more on the rough side too. This coaster is delightfully unhinged, and I want more GCIs like this one. Also, the logo has a little cowboy man on it, and it's cute. I beg you to put it on a shirt right now, Valley Fair. Put it on a hat. Put it on a patch. Put it on a f***ing shirt. Phew! Alright. As you can probably tell, I think Renegade is worth a visit alone. On top of that, you have two very nerdy attractions at this park. You have an aggressive and unique arrow in Excalibur. It might not be preserved for a long time, so Excalibur felt like a pretty high priority for me. Even if it was quite more on the shorter side than I expected, I did not feel let down from Excalibur. And I'm thankful to have that ride experience. Then after that, you have the holding brake on Steel Venom. This is a very nerdy thing to care about, and I also thought it helped make the trip worth it. What can I say? Besides, I have a lot of nostalgia for V2 at my home park. I really, really miss that holding break. I miss it so much. Even if Valley Fair's lineup isn't super appealing to you, Nickelodeon Universe at Mall of America is very close nearby and sweetens the deal a little bit. So those are my thoughts and rankings on the Valley Fair roller coaster lineup. If you've been to Valley Fair, how close does it match up with yours? This has been Zero Credits Remaining, reminding you all to gatekeep me in the comments for liking Wild Thing. I like that it's tall. Bye! Rap the biggest